and Margaret Casely Hayford. J.E. Casely Hayford, my grandfather, an African nationalist, journalist and political activist, published Ethiopia Unbound in 1911. Its observations and philosophical debates explore African identity and struggles for emancipation and influence the movement for Ghanaian and other African independence. One of the first published novels in English by an African, said to be the earliest pan-African fiction, it expresses views on colonialism by an educated African who went to Cambridge, returned to the Gold Coast, now Ghana, saw the exploitation of his people from fresh eyes and considered possible solutions. One reviewer said that Marcus Garvey was inspired by it, and J.E. in fact admired and followed Garvey. It's optimistic, as J.E. heralded an independence that wasn't actually achieved until 1957. Called a philosophical novel, a treatise, a dialogue of rationalism and Edwardian romance, and a meditation on love, self, family and community, it references African and classical myths and analyses contemporary political struggles and, of course, of Africans under colonial rule. The writer of the foreword to the second edition, Professor Aguna, says Casey Hayford is certain in the end that there would be victory over the colonial oppression in the Gold Coast and that his people, the Fante, would enjoy their freedoms and independence as citizens equal to any in the world. For him, this is not just their objective, it's the aim of the entire Ethiopian world, by which he means all of Africa. Rise, you mighty giant, rise, Ethiopia will soon be unbound. Possibly considering German sympathies with the Boers, J.E. writes that war ended the myth of white supremacy. There was dread of German domination, which made one think, if there's something wrong in being dominated by another nation, and a desperate keenness for self-determination, then why shouldn't this be universal? It also showed the brutality and vulnerability of white man so it gave fresh cause for reflection. J.E. uses the symbolism of Ethiopia, the only country in Africa at that time that was not colonised. Drawing illustrative analogies, he notes that Jews under Moses went back to Zion after slavery in Egypt. African freed slaves saw themselves as returning to Ethiopia, displacing foreign powers. J.E. promotes pan-Africanism based on cultural nationalism because in the face of European sneers, contemporary Africans suppress their culture. It's interesting that when this book was republished in the 1960s, African Americans during the civil rights movement promoted a similar philosophy. The fictionalized journey of an educated man sometimes is compared to Swift or Bunyan, and it references Christian and Talmudic writings, Shinto and Buddhism, Homeric journeys and draws analogies with religious and secular traditions. Yet it is an easy read because the characters are well drawn and familiar and are gently mocked to emphasise points. He, for example, similarly criticises the drunken white miner who considers himself superior on the grounds of his colour alone, the vain, supercilious colonial officer, and the old African imitator who slavishly follows without preserving anything of his own heritage. The book investigates religion as the basis for decisions, morality and actions through discussion between the hero and his friend Whiteley, whom he meets at university then in London, later in Africa. When Whiteley's convenient form of Christianity is found increasingly deficient in its morality and also frequently weaponised against the indigenous population, it's an important theme of the book. It's clear that Whiteley, a theology student, aiming for the priesthood is losing his religion. The hero compares this fickle faith to the more encompassing spirit, spirituality of the animist faiths of Africans, which he says aren't dissimilar to the Egyptian, Roman and ancient, e ancient Greeks' religious relationships with their respective worlds. He says, you're only drifting away from the ancient moorings that you Westerners built in sand. Jesus Christ came from the East, was born in Bethlehem and nurtured in Egypt, yet you seek to teach him to us. We have caught his spirit and live. You follow the letter and are tossed hither and thither by every wind. The superficiality of Whiteley's religion is evident when Whiteley's horrified by the question, what if our Lord had been born of an Ethiopian woman, which Whiteley considers absurd. 
This, an alarming turning point for our hero, makes him realise the exclusive nature of this Christianity. What if bishops and prelates felt the same and yet dared propagate a religion which teaches one thing and practices another? Is it worth following? At Secondi, the hero observes with disgust that the preacher was a white man preaching to a black congregation, yet a notice outside on the front wall of the church informed that there would be a service just for Europeans in the clubhouse at the station later. The hero recognises also Europeans are strengthened by an innate feeling in, and belief in the superiority, superiority of their culture and he observes no people could despise its own language, customs and institutions and hope to avoid national death. He admires the efforts of the Welsh, the Scots and the Irish to retain their own languages and cultures. The hero reflects sadly that Africans helping the British against the Dutch to protect and grow British commercial interests in West Africa were not remembered by the British government. As he puts it, one can materially contribute to the building of pavements on which one may not walk. Taken as a metaphor or a fact, it's a wretched position. He noted that any progressive colonialists were despised by the majority. One senior administrator observed, they're mere handfuls of white fools who are blind enough not to see where their bread is buttered and who advocate equal rights for the native and all that tobby rot. Now, the 24th of May was Empire Day, but gave way to Commonwealth Day celebrations, no longer widely remembered as part of the history of the countries that made this country its wealth. Does awareness of British history demand greater knowledge of the Commonwealth? Diplomats joked in the 1960s that what was common was not the wealth, the implication being that other Commonwealth countries were too dependent on Britain. Yet, the wealth of this nation has been heavily contributed to by those relied upon not just for valuable resources, but often manpower to create, bolster and during wars protect the commercial gains and lives of Britain. My opinion is my grandfather would feel that some imbalance was redressed if the immense contribution of the Commonwealth was recognised as such. So going back to his hero, he speaks of a considerate Scot who realised the duplicity of his instructions from the diplomatic administration. He was to oversee development and progress of the indigenous population, and yet it was wrong of him to facilitate their actual progress, for example, when they wanted to establish education for children. In further denigration of the superficial Christianity, J.E. noted that there are certain nations who call themselves Christians, yet claim a monopoly on culture, knowledge and civilization, and think they, are heaven -born, they have a heaven-born right to survive and thrive, whilst others don't. They're mostly whites, and when brown, yellow, yellow or black men resist and show no intention to submit, they hysterically cry out, the yellow peril or black peril. So J.E. was bold and unafraid to speak, speak truth to power and not naive in recognising that you have to be prepared for the consequences. Considering the continuing struggle between Islam and Christianity for the devotion of the black man, he asked which will win and referred back to the inherent inequality in Christianity and stated, it looks as if the Crescent will eventually win as Christianity is divided against itself because its leaders are untrue. He defines Christianity's negative deployment, we shall teach them our religion, and that will make them ours, body and soul, land, goods, and all for all time. Yet it's not all despondency, because J.E. is a follower of the writings of Blyden, who teaches that understanding the essence of yourself, i.e. your culture, is your redemption, and he exhorts, exhorts man, know thyself. Redemption also comes from our own technological skills and enterprise and industrial training, which would reveal the good things of our nationality. He hankers after a simple world in which man strives for a greater good through which people become mutually supportive. The ending of the book, however, is to us unfathomable because the world has already moved on. Although the simplicity he seeks might be a necessary outcome of the world stopped or slowed by a pandemic, we can't ignore the dominance of English as a, a universal tool through the ubiquity of broadcast and computer technology. In line with the essence and importance of this book, England 
need no longer bind others culturally. The ubiquity of English through technology has possibly re-evaluated it. The language, a tool enabling greater insight rather than introducing the culturally imperialistic ties that bind. The bravery of speaking truth to power, which continually carries with it threat of retribution, whether loss of position, reputation or even life, still, of course, overhangs. And it was salutary to hear actor John Boyega summarise that anxiety when, at a Black Lives Matter demonstration following the killing of unarmed George Floyd by American police, he pleaded for justice but ended ruefully, I don't know whether I will ever work again. In such a context, this is not just an illuminating book, because having regard to the imperialistic setting in which J.E. was writing, it was an extremely bold work, of which I feel fiercely proud.